I'd like to take a little bit of time and explain to you what we know about how wireless signals impact our biological systems, how they cause disease, ranging from electrohypersensitivity to autism, to brain tumors, to immune dysfunction, to reproductive dysfunction, to endocrine dysfunction, to digestive problems, to unexplained anxiety, to sleep disturbances, to short-term memory loss, to difficulty learning. I've been in public health for more than 30 years. I believe this is potentially the most serious problem that mankind has ever faced. The good news tonight is that we can fix this problem. Cell phones had never been tested for safety before they were sold to millions and millions of people. Back in 1993, uh, following public hearings in Washington, D.C. about the possible link between cell phones and brain cancer, the cell phone industry pledged what became $28.5 million to do research that would fill in the data gaps that were there in the process of doing that work. By 1999, we had identified that the radiation from cell phone could cause genetic damage, that the radiation from cell phones could cause leakage in the blood-brain barrier, that the radiation from cell phones, as little as 500 minutes a month, could cause more than a doubling in the risk of brain tumors. And when we went public with that information, in 1999, we said that if we don't do something, we're going to have an enormous problem within the next decade. Now, unfortunately, we were right. The first thing that we've learned is that when we are in the presence of an information-carrying radio wave, our bodies interpret that as a foreign invader. And when our bodies interpret something as a foreign invader, what happens is that the body closes down. The body closes down to protect itself. And that closing down goes all the way down to an individual cell. Now, normally speaking, a cell membrane is opened like this so that nutrients are able to come into the cell and waste products are able to go out of the cell. But when a cell is under stress or under threat, it closes down. And when the cell membrane closes down, we call that a sympathetic stress reaction. Now normally, cells go between sympathetic stress and what we call parasympathetic monitoring several times a minute. In the presence of an information carrying radio wave from a cell phone, from a Wi-Fi connection, from a base station that's in the community, from satellite radio, from police radio, any of those communication devices, when that signal sits in the environment around your cell, and this occurs whether it's a brain cell or a nerve cell or a muscle cell or an endocrine cell, the cell stays in this sympathetic lock position. And when that happens, Nutrients are not able to get into the cell. The cell becomes energy deficient. When the cell becomes energy deficient, the first thing that the cell loses the ability to do is intercellular communication. And when cells can't talk to each other, they cannot function as tissues. 
And when tissues cannot talk to each other, they cannot function as organs. And when organs are not able to talk to each other, the organism cannot function. This slide is of live blood under dark field microscopy. Red blood cells. The slide on the left, normal red blood cells. Blood cells have to talk to each other to be able to work as tissue. Blood is a tissue. So that red blood cell, as it's going through a vein or an artery, has to know where the other red blood cells are so it doesn't bump into them. So that the slide on the left shows well-functioning red blood cells. The radar is working so they don't bump into other red blood cells. The slide on the right is after five minutes of cell phone. What that shows is a bunch of red blood cells that have bumped into each other and have stuck to each other. Now when that happens, those red blood cells are not able to do their job. Those red blood cells on the right hand side are useless to your body. They're cleansed through the liver and they go away. And if red blood cells don't do their job, what happens? Oxygen is not delivered to cells and tissues. And when oxygen is not delivered, you have fatigue, and you have a general disruption of physiologic process. This is one example of what happens when intercellular communication is disrupted by the exposure to these information carrying radio waves. Another example is in the immune system. The immune system works by signals that go to the immune system from local areas where you have bacteria or other types of invasions, infections into the system. In the presence of information carrying radio waves, your immune system becomes compromised. One of the early signs of disease related to information carrying radio waves, something as simple as a cold that won't go away because the immune system cannot be summoned to send macrophages and T cells to kill an infection. Another thing that happens after the information carrying radio waves close down the cell membrane is that free radicals cannot get out of the cell. Now the interesting thing about free radicals is that they're highly reactive, they're the most reactive uh, molecules that, that we have in living tissue. Free radicals can be organic or they can be metals. But the cell does everything it can to move the free radicals out. But when the doors are closed, the free radicals cannot get out. These free radicals love a party. And inside the cell, the party is happening at the mitochondria. And when they go to the mitochondria, they compromise the ability of the cell to produce its own energy. When a cell becomes energy deficient, if it's in the early part of its life cycle, the cell moves into something called mitosis, which is the cell splits into two cells. If it's in the latter part of its life cycle, it goes into something called apoptosis. This either mitosis or apoptosis is triggered prematurely by the buildup of the free radicals that attack the mitochondria. Two things can happen. The first is that when you have cells going into apoptosis, they can't work. So that now you have tissue dysfunction because the cells are dying. One example of that is leakage, is leakage in the blood-brain barrier. And when the blood-brain barrier opens, now you have dangerous chemicals that are circulating in the blood, doing damage directly 
to defenseless brain cells. The other thing that happens is that the free radicals that are inside the cell will attach to anything that has an open end. And inside the cell, we have messenger RNA continually moving through the cytoplasm to tell the DNA in the nucleus what's going on outside the cell. And free radicals disrupt the transcription of information between messenger RNA and DNA. Free radicals also disrupt the ability of broken DNA to be properly repaired. When the free radicals disrupt DNA repair, we have the formation of something called micronuclei inside the cells. And so long as that cell is functioning, those micronuclei simply clutter up the inside of the cell. But when that cell goes in to apoptosis and the cell membrane disintegrates, everything that's inside the cell is released into the interstitial fluid or the interstitial space. Everything else sort of floats away, but the micronuclei have membranes. And they're released into nutrient-rich interstitial fluid. And they're able to clone, and they're able to proliferate. And when that process goes on, we have the development of the tumor. So, so far, in terms of pathological mechanisms, from the radiation from your cell phone, or from the Wi-Fi, or from the base station, we have disruption of intracellular communication. We also have cellular dysfunction. We also have disruption of DNA repair. And we also have one more thing. That is, when the cell membranes close down, the Froelich energy on the endomembrane, the inside of the cell membrane, determines how messenger RNA folds. Messenger RNA has the job of telling the DNA in the nucleus and later in the mitochondria what is going on outside of the cell. When the cell is closed down, the Froelich energy causes the messenger RNA to fold in such a way that it says that the normal cell membrane looks like this. It does not look like this. So then what happens is that that information gets transferred to the DNA. Because the free radicals interfering with mitochondrial function, when that cell is triggered into premature mitosis, the daughter cells have a cell membrane that looks like this, not like this. It's an environmentally induced genetic change. That is what we see in people who are electrohypersensitive. Their bodies have changed the way they make cells. Instead of the cell membrane being open, able to receive nutrients and expel waste product, the cell membrane is now closed. That cell membrane now is in a state of chronic sympathetic stress. We call that sympathetic lock. And that is why a person who is electrohypersensitive is hypersensitive to all forms of electromagnetic fields. Whether it's an electric field from an alarm clock, or whether it's from a microwave oven, or whether it's from a cell phone, or whether it's from a Wi-Fi. Extreme electrohypersensitivity is a change in the way your body makes cells. Most people in the medical community were never taught about this. Now the mechanism of harm that involves this change in how the cell membranes are formed is part of the mechanism that we now believe is involved in autism. Autism is an epidemic today. In the 1970s, autism occurred in about 1 in 10,000 births. By the end of the 1990s, the incidence of autism is about 1 in 250. In 2002, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States 
issued a report saying that autism was now 1 in 150. The last official estimate that we have. But clinics around the world who treat autistic children, those doctors believe that autism now is occurring in about 1 in every 100 births. Now there have been many studies talking about, for example, mercury-containing vaccines and other types of exposures that could lead to these symptoms. The interesting thing is that virtually all of those studies are correct. And most of the children, if not all of the children with autism, have a difficulty clearing metals from their cells. They have a methylation deficit. Methylation is the way that metals come out of the cells. So that there is a genetic component where they can't clear metals as quickly as other children can. Is so that when a child is born, its blood-brain barrier is not formed. By the age of about six months, the anatomical part of the blood-brain barrier is formed. But the functional completeness of the blood-brain barrier doesn't occur until about age two. And around age two is when we begin to see most of the diagnoses of autism. And one theory holds that what happens is, is that when the blood-brain barrier is formed at age two, these metals get trapped inside the brain cells. Now if you take that child and you put him in an environment where there are information carrying radio waves, now you have the cell membrane closing down so that the metals are further trapped. When the metals are trapped inside the cells, you have the change in formic energy so that those cell membranes, when they go through mitosis and split, have a configuration like this and not like this. In terms of pathological mechanisms, we have this man-made information carrying radio wave that resonates at the cell membrane and causes the cell membrane to believe it's under siege. So the cell membrane closes down. Nutrients cannot get in. Waste products build, build up inside the cell. First thing that goes is intercellular communication. Then you have cellular dysfunction. You have interference with DNA repair, leading to cloning that provides a mechanism for the development of tumors. Most insidiously, you have this change in the folding of messenger RNA, which changes the DNA in the cells and leads to, in adults, electrohypersensitivity. Children, now we believe this is a major causal factor in autism and other related conditions. So you, you have to be wondering, when's this guy going to get to the good news? We understand the pathological mechanisms. We understand that there has to be resonance with ciliary receptors at the cell membrane for the biological effect cascade to ensue. We understand that that resonance takes five to eight seconds to be recognized by the cell. And we also know that it takes about 30 seconds for the biological response to kick in. By knowing those things, now we're able to figure out ways to stop the resonance at the cell membrane level. By knowing that part of the pathology is the disruption of intracellular communication, we know that if we can restore intracellular communication, now we can ameliorate symptoms. We know that when the cell membrane is closed down, that metals get trapped inside. If we can open up the cell membrane, now we can detox those metals. All of those interventions are now things that can be used to help patients with electrohypersensitivity, autism, and these other conditions. Right now, we have a lot of sick people. Long term, we have to change the infrastructure for delivery of rapid telecommunications. We have developed schematics that are based on maximizing fiber optic infrastructure and minimizing wireless. And wherever there is wireless, using technology that is able to stop the resonance at the cell membrane level. The solutions that we're talking about here have been known for a very, very long time.